Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am tonight's entertainment. So, we have all heard of this phrase, with great power comes great responsibility. And I tried to find the origin of this phrase, so it was first said, you know, in the French National Convention, and then all the presidents and prime ministers all over the world used it. With great power comes great responsibility. But you know, there's something else that comes with great power. Great electricity bills. <laughs> so, you know, we are here because we want to discuss about energy, you know, hashtag energy, because energy is the hot topic right now. So let's talk about some really bizarre ways of getting energy. A pickup line at a bar? Yes, it's true. You know, in Stockholm, there's a company that installed these instruments in the railway station that use the heat of people moving around the station to actually heat another building across the road. It's true. There are other bizarre ways of getting energy at a club. You can have piezo materials on the floor, and when you dance around, these piezo materials are actually generating electricity to, you know, give energy for the lights at the disco. And this thing actually exists in Rotterdam at a club. You should go there. It's awesome. Or sugar can make you fly. We all know this song. So, sh breaking down sugar actually gives three times more hydrogen than water. And we know, all know that there's a lot of research going on in hydrogen, that you know, hydrogen is the energy of the future. Now, apart from just thinking about different ways of getting energy, there's another way of maybe conserving energy. And one of the methods is making things as light as possible. You know, you take an automobile, you take a plane, you make it light, it uses less fuel, you're the captain planet. Now, how do we make things as light as possible? Well, one solution is actually going to other celestial bodies. That's the cunning plan. So, these are calculations. 80 kgs on Earth would weigh just 5.3 kgs on Pluto. You know, we are really, really, really happy. We save a lot of energy. But the only problem is going there, and Matt Damon was the only one who ended up in Mars, <laughs> and he did not like it. So, we have to stay on planet Earth and reduce the weight of everything. It's not only in the automobile industry that people are trying to lose weight, even in the consumer industry. You know, every six months, oh wait, six is too long, every four months, Apple comes up with a new product, and every single time, they stress on the fact that, you know, this product is as light as possible. This is the lightest thing in the world. And to be honest, we are coming to a situation where Apple products are getting lighter than the actual Apple. <laughs> you know, that is a true story. So, talking about lightweight materials, we can view this in two ways. One is, we take old materials that are already being used and tweak it to make it stronger. Now, when an old material gets stronger, you can use less material for the same properties. You save weight. Another way forward is you introduce a completely new material that pretty much does the same job. So let's have an overview of both these kinds of things. So first, let's take an old material that is being used and tweak it around to you know, make it better. The oldest material we know is steel. And for steel is basically Iron Man plus carbon and some other elements, you get steel, Man of Steel. Interesting. So, how many of you know this diagram? Ooh, quite a few. Okay. 
Good. I'm very happy. So this is the iron carbide diagram. And you know that there are different phases in this diagram. Austenitic phase, ferritic phase, blah. So when you take a material, you have different phases. And when you deform it, these phases, they deform in different ways. They have their own individual properties. So what you can do is you can play around with these phases, with the stability of these phases, to improve the properties of this material. It's a little hard to understand, right? Uh, you know what that diagram is? It's a very bad sketch of Europe. Okay? So imagine different countries as different phases. Now if you have to bring about a change in Europe, these countries would behave in different ways, right? Now you can tweak this around to make the properties a lot better. So let's take an example. Let's take two countries, France and Italy. I'm trying to be as neutral as possible, so let's not take Germany. So France and Italy. So Europe is your material. France and Italy are your two phases, okay? Now, both belong to Europe. They have beautiful Mediterranean climate in the south along the coast and really good wine and cheese. Right. Now, you have an external factor like temp temperature, pro temperature in a material. Now, let's take an external factor. You have the people in France. The external factor being President of United States coming over to France. Let's name him DT. Okay, so some people in France are really not happy with his policies. They move to Italy, some of them. So this is similar to elemental partitioning. Using these external treatments like heat, you can partition elements like manganese, carbon to move into different phases. And once this happened, these different phases would react differently. For example, in France. Now, for example, in Italy. Now, the French people moving to Italy would not be Italians. They would still be French, right? Now, the stability of Italy actually changes. You would have really weird products coming out, like a Peugeot symbol on a Ferrari. So, Italy would react in a completely different way. Now, this is exactly the same way. Using heat treatments, you can partition elements into these different phases, and these different phases would behave differently. Now, how you do that, or you, how you tweak them around, would really depend on what properties in the material you, you, you are looking at. So basically, you take the same old steel that you use, you make different treatments, you make it better, you make it lighter, you use less material, you're Captain Planet, hashtag energy. Now, let's move to the other system where you introduce a completely new material to pretty much do the same job. And this is where lightweight materials come in. Now, the lightweight materials that you know of, like titanium and aluminium, are you know, being used everywhere in the industry. But what if I introduce you to a material that is half the density of aluminium and one-fourth the density of steel? I'm talking about real lightweight stuff. I introduce you to the friendly neighborhood Biodegradable Mülleimer. <laughs> okay, so the material I'm talking about is not paper, but if you see, this has a hexagonal structure, and I'm talking about magnesium. Magnesium is one of the lightest structural metals available to us. This guy can give a very, very hard competition to the other lightweight materials out there in the market. But why is magnesium not really being used? 
For that, we need to study the physics behind the deformation mechanism of magnesium and probably, you know, tweak it around to make it better, to make its formability better. So let's study physics. You have the same Mulheimer, and I give it two axes, the C and the A. Easy stuff. Now, when you deform a material, there are slip systems being activated. By slip systems, I mean layers of atoms just slide over each other. Now, in magnesium, as you can see, it's highly anisotropic in nature. So most of the slip systems are easily activated in the C direction, in the A direction, and it's very, very, very hard to activate a slip system in the C direction. Now, what happens is you have a block of metal with Mulheimer's oriented in different orientations, and you roll the entire thing, and all the Mulheimer's actually get stacked up like that. Now, when you deform a material, for example, to make a door of a car, you pressurize that and it breaks because there is no strain accommodation in the C direction. Now, as engineers, you know, we really like these problems because we get a lot of money for this, except for when we are doing our thesis. You know, that's when we actually tear our hair apart. So, what can we do? Let's select some atoms. You know this, right? So this is the periodic table. It's really interesting. I learned it long, long back in my sixth grade. And down there, we have the lanthanide and actinide series. We don't really give a damn about them except for the nuclear scientists. But sometimes they are helpful. So what you have down there are big, fat, atoms. Big fat atoms can actually be helpful at times. So you take this big fat atom and you add it to this hexagonal structure, that's your Mulheimer. What happens with that is to your left you have magnesium atoms happily sitting around each other and to your right you have this big fat atom coming and sitting over there. And because of this, there are dilations in the lattice. So the energetics of you know, the atoms change, or the slip systems change. Because of this, you might have good formability in your C direction. So the formability of materials can be tweaked around by you know, alloying or other various ways. So how is all this helpful? One steel door is equivalent to four, magne four magnesium doors or maybe two lightweight steel components. Things are getting lighter. So how can this be used? You have a car that gives about six liters per 100 kilometer. You have another car made of you know, lightweight materials that gives you four liters per 100 kilometer. You save a lot of fuel and you save a lot of money. Now what can you do with the money? We can give it to Greece. You know, and at the end of it, you are really, really happy because you're the Captain Planet. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Think lightweight. Thank you.